there are these two old friends who hadn't seen, seen each other in quite a while. They're catching up on things at a restaurant. The one said to the other, why is it you have not yet been married? The other friend said, well, to tell you the truth, I've been looking my whole life for the perfect woman. There were several times I thought I had found her. Once in Barcelona, I met a woman who was beautiful, intelligent, and oh, she filled my heart. I thought certainly that this was the one I should marry. But I come to find out she was vain, conceited, so all that came to an end. But then once in Boston, I met a woman who was outgoing and generous, seemed perfect to me in every way. Only later I come to find out she was flighty, irresponsible. So she definitely was not the one for me. But then recently, I met a woman from Montreal, intelligent, beautiful, generous, warm, great sense of humor, and dedicated to serving others. I said to myself, that's the one. This is the perfect woman. This is the woman I should marry. Well, said the friend, why, why didn't you marry her? The other man gave a real deep sigh and said, well, as it turns out, she was looking for the perfect man. <laughs> None of us are perfect, so if you're looking for a perfect spouse, you're not gonna find one. But you can find the one that's perfect for you. However, for all of us, whether we remain single, religious like myself, or get married, we're called by our Lord Jesus to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Now once again, we talk about this from time to time. How are we supposed to pull that off? First of all, by taking what already is perfect, God, and fully accepting our Lord's invitation to incorporate Him into every aspect of our lives. We become perfect by taking in the perfect. And part of taking in the perfect is to listen and to fully accept the great teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially through Scripture. Like for example, we have the wonderful teaching from St. Matthew of the Beatitudes. But here today from St. Luke's Gospel, we have a slightly different version where it's sometimes called the Sermon on the Plain. Because Jesus, is, he's not talking at the sea or on a mountain, he's talking on a stretch of level ground. So let's break down his teachings, we can add more grace to our lives, and indeed, be on our way to becoming perfect, as God is perfect. Our teaching today begins with a small but not insignificant detail from St. Luke. Jesus raised his eyes toward his disciples. This means what? He looked up to God, the Father, and then down upon the people showing what he was about to say would be in perfect sync with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So the people knew that he was about to be spoken would be not just very important, but full of grace and blessing. And for the apostles, for the twelve who saw our Lord do this a few times, they knew that what our Lord Jesus was about to do, was about to say, would be life-changing. It was as if they're going, oh man, this is going to be good, man, okay? So you ever see me raise my eyes to God and then down upon you? You better watch out, man, okay? <laughs> Our Lord then, he starts off with a series of insights with the phrase, blessed are you. Now the word here used for Jesus for blessed is slightly different from the word that you would use maybe at synagogue for, for blessing, praise, or thanksgiving. And it's a lot more what some translators have put as instead of saying blessed are you, some translated as happy are you. It's a lot more than that, because happiness comes and goes. The blessedness can remain no matter what you're going through. So the word here is actually a type of joyful outburst. It actually is a congratulations. Our Lord is basically saying, if you're going through the things I'm about to say, well then congratulations, for you will truly be blessed. So the first thing he's congratulating the people is, blessed are you who are poor. I might be thinking, well, wait a minute, why should I be congratulated by the Lord for being poor? Well, remember now, this is not just referring to people who are financially or materially poor, because people who are rich, but who are also generous with their blessings, can also be very poor in spirit. And that's the key. So this means what? Blessed are you who desperately depend on God. That's what that means. See, God's not someone you turn to only when you're in trouble. You are blessed because you are poor in spirit, meaning you deeply depend on God all the time. If you depend on God all the time, then without doubt, the kingdom of God is yours, 
Or in other words, the presence of God is always right there, just a breath away to provide whatever you might need. Next we have, blessed are you who are now hungry. This simply means that you have not just a little grumbling in your soul, a little sign that you're hungry. No, rather you have a famine, a starvation for the word of God. And even if you've been reading the Bible for years, or at your house you've got all kinds of books and CDs and all kinds of videos about the saints and the church and Jesus, you're still starving for more. Yeah, that's how it is. That's how that works. But the beautiful thing is the Lord promises you will be satisfied. So don't push that away. Feed yourself with the word of God, okay? Next we have, blessed are you who are now weeping. Jesus is basically saying here, congratulations that you are saddened now, you're crying now, because that tells me you're totally with me for the concern of the salvation of others. See, why should we be weeping? Why indeed are many of you weeping? Because so many people out there, so many people that you love, are not living their lives in the way they should be. They're not glorifying God. What's interesting is that you will receive, if you are grieving this way, what? Jesus says, but you will laugh. Anytime you can still laugh, it shows that there's still hope, there's still joy, there's still our Lord working on those people as he wants to try to save them, as he's working on us. But to put that another way, we can laugh because despite all the seemingly unanswered prayers, all prayers are answered, but sometimes it doesn't seem that way. Despite the frustrations, despite the concerns for others, we have not lost our peace. We have not lost our faith. We have not despaired. We have not given up. Because we know, this is why we can laugh. In the end, light conquers darkness. Life destroys death. Jesus is victorious over evil. That's why we can still laugh. But next from our Lord is this. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and denounce your name as evil as a count of the Son of Man. A couple things to discuss here first. If you find that some people don't hate you and exclude you, you might have to take a look to see if you really are standing up to witnessing to our Lord Jesus and to his church. Because if you are who you are called to be, a true disciple of Jesus, a true Catholic, Many people are not going to care at all for the truth that you will be bringing. Well, guess what? Bring it anyway. Because none of us can forget that persecution is the reward of being a disciple of Jesus. It's not a side effect. It's not an unfortunate result. It's the reward. So what is it you're supposed to do when others do hate you or even think of you as being evil for speaking the truth? Which, unfortunately, we see all, all around us in these days. Rejoice. Leap for joy on that day. Why? Because your reward will be great in heaven. You see, one of the ways of getting to heaven is not just by being good, caring, loving, holy, treating others with respect. It's also by proclaiming the truth in love so others can be set free, despite the fact that sometimes they might totally lose their minds when you give them the truth and then attack you. Don't you let that take your peace from you. You rejoice because you're doing your job. Now, Lord Jesus, besides being our great Savior, is also the greatest example of a prophet. A prophet, as you know, is one who speaks on behalf of God. When God is speaking for God, what you know what he's telling is, of course, true. A prophet not just brings blessings to encourage us, but he also brings potential curses, which could come about to the people who refuse to follow the will of God. So here it comes across now in St. Luke's Gospel in a few statements of woe to you. First of all, what does it really mean when Jesus says the word woe? It means that he himself, our great Lord, who suffered and died for perfect love for you, is still grieving over what people are doing or not doing. Yes, the things that we do that go against our Lord do indeed grieve his heart. He's not immune to that. He still loves us. Because remember, love, God himself, demands that love given be returned in love. And when it's not, 
It literally grieves the very heart of God. But the word woe also means that there will be consequences that will have to be paid. The first one is this, woe to you who are rich if you have received your consolation. Now again, this does not refer to those who are rich materially or to any other social class. The term here that St. Luke uses for those who are rich is a technical term for someone who has taken on a debt. And let's be honest, because of our sins, we are all in debt to our Lord. We owe him our entire lives. So what Jesus is saying is this, woe, or rather bankruptcy, will come to the one who does not acknowledge, who simply refuses to admit that we owe everything to our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, part of the problem is this, we don't let God console us, we try to console ourselves. Well, that's not gonna last, but his consolation does. But the final group of woes can all be tied together. Woe to you who are filled now, you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, you will grieve and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for their ancestors treated the false prophets in this way. So notice here, Jesus is again, he's not ad addressing a certain group of people, but he's rather condemning four things so that we can avoid them. First, we don't stop being greedy and super attached to worldly and material things, there's a good chance well, we might miss out on the kingdom of heaven. Second, avoid all forms of gluttony. This is not just with food, where we eat way too much and waste so much, but also being gluttonous when it comes to the stuff in our lives. Live simply, as Jesus is telling us to do. Third, avoid being self-indulgent. Sometimes we take way too much joy in things that are not gonna last. So invest not so much in material things, but in spiritual things. Receive joy and even laughter, not so much from the fancy stuff you own, but in your prayer life, in your relationship with our Lord Jesus, because that joy can last forever. And finally, don't always be running around looking for flattery, looking to be noticed for purely human glory. The glory that you should want, the glory that you should seek, is the glory of God. And he will most certainly share with you of his majesty, of his credible, mighty glory. So sum all of this up, if you can avoid the woes, the things in your life that bring grief to our Lord Jesus, and instead live in such a way that you are blessed, where Jesus will congratulate you for what you are doing, you're well on your way to becoming that perfect man, woman, or child that God has always called you to be.